Uh, it's uh, always uh, an honor indeed to join the faculty of this uh, wonderful meeting. So my task in the next um, 20 something minutes is to share with you the normal and abnormal postoperative imaging findings in the repaired rotator cuff and to share with you also the top 10 in answers to questions. So first of all, which are the main clinical indication for imaging or indications? Uh, persistent or new pain together with or without disability following surgery are the main indications. It seems that according to literature data, 25% of patients after rotator cuff repair present with pain or disability, and the ma major differential diagnosis includes retear, impingement, postoperative synovitis, and hardware dislodgement. Following a, a, a surgical procedure, we have edema and hemorrhage here and there. We have abnormal signal within the tendons or muscles, and therefore we have to know that we are expecting the normal or the so-called expected postoperative findings. And these occur up to three or six months postoperatively. At, at about 12 months postoperatively, we have a normal signal back to the tendons. So which are the normal findings regarding the plain films? I have asked for some lowering down the, the, the lights uh, so that you can see better the images. Um, very, very often we have some details which are not obvious if the lights are uh, very strong. So uh, uh, what we have to look first of all is the acromioclavicular, uh, sorry, the distance between the humeral hand and the acromion, this has to be at least seven millimeters and then the devices have to be on site. For instance, this anchor here was used for fixating the subscapularis tendon. But we need to know is that we have to have on the desk an X-ray film which was taken after the operation so that we can discriminate malpositioning which occurred intraoperatively from a future migration of the devices. Let's move now to the ultrasound which have more and more evolving role in assessing the postoperative patient. What do we expect as the normal findings, not the abnormal findings? The normal findings consist of this hyperechoic elongated structures here. These are such a material. And also we may see a normal thickness of the tendon together with smooth contour. This irregularity of the cortex here very often is induced by the orthopedic surgeon in order to accelerate the healing process of the footprint of the tendon which has been attached here. So this is also a normal finding. I have here two examples for you. Uh, supraspinatus repair, we see the suture material. So which are the next issues to be addressed here? It's the footprint integrity. You see the footprint of the supraspinatus tendon here. It's a beak-like appearance. We have fluid within the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, this hypoechoic area. Sometimes this is also thickened. thickened. We have a loculation of the, of, the, of the bursal fluid. So we have a thickened bursa with some debris inside. And of course, the position of the anchor has to be uh, the expected one here. We see into the bone together with a suture here. And these are the normal appearances. Sometimes with the Doppler, we have some neovascularity peritendus, which drops down significantly by six months postoperatively. Let's move now to the most powerful tool, which is magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, we have two groups here. One group is three months postoperatively, up to three months, and the next one is between three and six months postoperatively. Here you see that there is an abnormal signal within the tendon. It looks like a retear. However, this is not a retear. It's granulation tissue. You see here that a few months later, we have restoration of the appearance of the tendon. Therefore, this is not a failed repair. It is a pseudo tear. We need to be familiar with that. I mean, we radiologists. In addition, bone marrow edema, which surrounds an anchor. It is a normal finding. It's not an inflammatory process which suggests failure. And few months later, you see that the bone marrow edema disappears. So this is, again, normal. According to literature data, no correlation exists between integrity of the calf repair and the 
clinical outcome in the long run. So we need also to know as radiologists this clinical information. Let me show you one recent case, 68 female with pain and limited range of motion. The preoperative um, uh, MRI shows uh, fluid, but the radiologist missed that here the signal in this area is lower than the fluid itself. And in the rotator cuff interval, there is edema, whereas the normal signal here should be same to fat. Therefore, there is abnormality in the RC interval. We see, of course, the full thickness there here with degeneration of the mildly dis uh, displaced tendon. We see fluid into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. There is thickening of the coracoacromial ligament. There is also fluid in the subacromial bursa here in these oblique sagittal images. So there was an erroneous or a, mi a misdiagnosis of adhesive capsulitis which, was, which coexisted with a rotator cuff tear. In the postoperative setting, you see three months postoperatively, there was intense pain and persistent pain and limited range of motion and the clinician was concerned um, about any infectious perhaps which was um, complicating the procedure. We still see here that there is an abnormal signal into the rotator cuff interval. There is bone marrow edema uh, surrounding the anchors and there is also a pseudo tear here in the supraspinatus tendon. So how can we overcome this, let's say, uh, drawback of magnetic resonance imaging? We need to inject contrast because we need also to remember that only 10% of asymptomatic patients after a repair have a normal tendon on a MAR. We need to clarify this and here is the result. This is an abnormal signal within the supraspinatus tendon on T1-weighted images. After contrast injection, we see that there is intense enhancement on oblique coronal and oblique sagittal fat suppressed images. Intense enhancement, this is normal. That's the normal reaction, the granulation tissue following the uh, repair of uh, the rotator cuff. The second group now, after six months, presents different um, findings. We have a superior subluxation of the humeral hand. We may see some fluid into the bursa. We may see the geyser sign. I will explain this in a couple of minutes. And we may see also osteolysis surrounding the biabsorbable anchors. After 12 months, the repair tendons return to a more normal appearance. So asymptomatic patients with good postoperative function may show tendon thinning, as you see here. There is a tendon thinning at the distal insertion of the supraspinatus. This is not partial tear, this is not attenuation, this is a normal appearance postoperatively. We have also some findings which are not clinically significant. For instance, this space in five years, no symptoms at all, very good uh, uh, result of the operation. We see some tunnels here of the, uh, of the anchors, but we see also that there is an ossification anteriorly, T1 bright, T1 bright, fat suppressed images black. This is ossification in the subscapularis tendon causing no symptoms at all. And the larger ossification in this patient, nine years after operation in the infraspinatus tendon, no problem, no symptoms at all. The function was perfect. Uh, with regard to the magnetic resonance arthrography, we are doing arthrograms particularly in elite athletes who have undergone uh, uh, rotator cuff repair. You see that there is contrast which enters the subacromial bursa. Therefore, the tendon repair does not mean that we have a watertight rotator cuff. We may see contrast escaping into the bursa, and the rotator cuff itself is intact. CT arthrography may be used also in patients who cannot undergo MRI either because of claustrophobia or because of uh, other contraindications or because we have lots of metals which produce artifacts inside. You see here the metallic component of an anchor. It's not downgrading the quality of image at all. And you see the iodine into the axillary recess not escaping into the rotator cuff. Therefore, the result is very good. 
So to sum up, in the post-operative setting, we radiologists need to be familiar with the normal post-operative findings. Otherwise, we are doing an overdiagnosis, which is not good for both sides, I mean for radiologists and for the orthopedic surgeons. We may be concerned regarding uh, findings which are not real or not clinically important. And of course it is your task to let us know the exact type of operation in order to interpret finding uh, more accurately. So let's move now to the really abnormal findings. Which are the abnormal findings on X-rays? We don't have many abnormalities here, but practically we may see some displacement of the anchors. Here is in the inferior uh, joint space. An anchor here may cause erosion, significant erosions in the articular cartilage. We may also see intact uh, anchors uh, in the humeral hand, but uh, almost zero distance between the acromion and the humeral hand, and this suggests a massive retear. But this is it. We don't have much to do with the plain X-rays. On the other hand, ultrasound is much more useful. Here you see the previous example I showed to you, the bursal uh, thickening and fluid, the anchor just in, in the immediate post-operative period, and a few months later we see no anchor into the bone, it has been displaced, we see the retracted tendon, and actually this here is the deltoid muscle which is um, abutting the bone because there is no supraspinatus there. So we can see the retear very accurately. And a few years ago, this meta-analysis uh, in a very good journal suggested that we have similar accuracies between ultrasound and MRI regarding the retear of a tendon. Let's move now to the Ferrari of imaging, the magnetic resonance imaging. What about retur? Before addressing this question, I would like to tell you that it's important for radiologists to apply the proper technique. For instance, here you see two techniques of fat suppression. One technique is spectral fat suppression. You see lots of artifacts. These are called susceptibility artifacts because of the presence of metals. And these artifacts actually downgrade significantly the quality of the image. We are not allowed to see what is going on in the distal insertion of the supraspinatus. Indeed, we may see also some inadequate fat suppression of the subcutaneous fat. So this is not allowed. We should apply stair sequence. The stair sequence has minimal artifacts and you see very nicely this discontinuity. We have fluid into the tendon. Is this a retear? This is questionable because about 20 years ago there was a paper published in Skeletal Radiology by friends in the Balkrist Hospital which suggested that small defects, smaller than one centimeter, may be totally asymptomatic. So small defects may not be clinically important. On the other hand, the literature is not clear enough regarding the rate of retail. You see that we may have a retail between 9 and 94% uh, percent of patients who have rotator cuff repair. But we are quite confident to suggest that uh, this retail occurs within the first three months postoperatively and that this retear is related to age, to the size of the tear, to the degree of retraction, the degree of degeneration, to the preoperative fat infiltration of the muscle and to the double row technique of suturing. So what we do in our report is particularly to address this issue here, the fat infiltration of the muscles. For instance, this lady, six, uh, 75, uh, six years after operation has pain, we see that the distance uh, between the humeral hand and the acromion is uh, almost zero. Uh, unfortunately, there was no subacromial decompression. You see that there are lots of um, osteophytes projecting under the acromion, so perhaps this was the cause of the retear. But in addition, with the tangent line method, we see that the supraspinatus tendon shows fat infiltration. This is gutale and uh, two, three, and this one in the infraspinatus is four. So usually in these patients, we don't have a chance of um, a very good uh, result. 
regarding the devices, this can be assessed, of course, that they have migrated, for instance, here, posterior superiorly, we can see such a device here uh, in the super posterior superior aspect of the joint. Usually we have joint diffusion, so it's easy to assess a loose body there. We ha may have partial detachment, and in um, uh, on ultrasound, we may see this acoustic shadowing behind the metal, which is suggesting that this is a metallic component. So uh, the Sugaya's classification has been suggesting the degree of integrity of the rotator cuff. I'm not using this routinely unless the orthopedic surgeon is seeking this information. It's easy, it's reproducible. You can see that with Sugaya 1, we have a very nice result. The tendon is black after one year. In Sugaya 2, we have an abnormal signal, but no discontinuity. In Sugaya 3, we may have a tear on the bursal side. Four, we have a complete full thickness tear with mild retraction, which is not going beyond the most superior part of the humeral hand. And this Gaia 5, we have a full thickness tear, which has a retraction which goes medially beyond the most superior aspect of the humeral hand. Let me show you now another example which shows the Geyser sign that we mentioned previously. This is 64 year man, two years after the operation. Without any doubt, there is a tear, full thickness tear with reduction of the uh, infraspina infraspinatus tendon. And you see that there is fluid which communicates with the glenohumeral joint and fluid which extends up to the AC joint. So this is the geyser sign, also shown on sagittal images. You see fluid entering the acromioclavicular joint. And this sign suggests that there is a severe impingement which disrupts the capsule and distorts the normal anatomy. In this particular patient, we see also fatty stripes into the uh, less uh, teres minor muscle. So there was a tear in the preoperative time, which was missed by radiologists. The geyser sign may be also seen with uh, CT arthrograms. You see here the contrast, the iodine contrast, going up and entering into the acromioclavicular joint, also on oblique sagittal images. So this is, a, uh, uh, let's say, a sign of a severe impingement which disrupts the anatomy. In this patient, uh, 15 years after the operation, we see that into the joint there is a large loose body, smaller loose bodies, and the oblique coronal images. We see lots of them also on transverse images. There is a retear with retraction. This is a synovial osteochondromatosis together with uh, osteoarthritis, you see osteophyte formation here, joint space narrowing, so synovial osteochondromatosis is a result, it's, it's secondary, it's not primary, it's not a young, a young patient, it's secondary to synovial metaplasia because of chronic irritation. So the ninth question has to do with the most comp complications. Between three to five patients of um, uh, uh, rotator cuff repair patients, we do have adhesive capsulitis. And the robust finding, the most powerful finding for suggesting the diagnosis is fat suppression T1 with gadolinium injection. You can see very nicely this area of enhancement into the rotator cuff interval. There is no doubt this is adhesive capsulitis. Let me show you a case, 85-year-old lady. She has um, preoperatively, you see the infraspinatus tear and the retraction. We see some edema into the infraspinatus muscle. This is denervation following the, the tendon disruption. And uh, postoperatively, you see that we have a retear. We have here a geyser sign. But in addition, instead of fat in the rotator cuff interval, this area should be as bright as the subcutaneous fat. We see abnormal signal. This is typical of frozen solder. Apart from adhesive capsulitis, we may see also synovitis. You see here a retear with a wavy appearance of the supraspinatus tendon, but into the joint we see this abnormal signal which represents synovitis. But this is even lower signal. This is the axillary uh, recess 
with uh, adhesions, same signal as the rotator cuff interval. So this is frozen shoulder, adhesive capsulitis, this is synovitis. Also on sagittal images, you see synovitis, adhesive capsulitis uh, on T2. The infection is very rare. I do not have any case in my files, so this is from the literature, just to highlight which are the steps and um, let's say the, uh, the most important task on behalf of radiologists. First of all, I think that we need to, to aspirate the joint with uh, ultrasound guidance. We need to isolate if there is any uh, microorganisms. And also we have to have a, a high level of suspicion because in general, we do not have systemic signs in this infection in general into the skeleton uh, the infections. And the role of uh, radiologists is to differentiate between the superficial and the deep uh, involvement of the anatomical structures in the shoulder because the superficial ones can be treated conservatively whereas the deep uh, with surgery here we see pass formation and abscess which extends into the deltoid muscle and then via fistula to the subcutaneous tissue. This was treated uh, conservatively. Regarding the osteochondral lesions, we know now that um, chondrolysis, which means destruction of cartilage, is the result of thermal devices during arthroscopy, malposition of devices. We commented already on that, and this is another issue. We need to be very careful on the amount, on the volume of uh, anesthetic that we are, and the type of anesthetic that we are usually using intra particularly. So overall, device migration, return, and instability may result in osteoarthritis and uh, rarely to synovial osteochondromatosis, as we have shown already such a case. Here you see that there is joint space narrowing inferiorly with osteophyte formation. The deltoid muscle atrophy occurred in the past with uh, open surgery, and uh, this is very rare now. We do not see it anymore. You see here in the deltoid muscle that we have um, fat stripes due to atrophy, and this is the area of dissection. The rotator cuff arthropathy is an entity which is not well known to radiologists. It's underdiagnosed, so it's important to address that on plain films, if there is zero hair distance between acromion and humeral head, but at the same time, we have cranial migration, uh, subarticular sclerosis, massive tear, as you can see here, no tendon at all, uh, apart from the subscapularis, then we have a rotator cuff arthropathy. Neurologic complications also are rare. CRPS or pseudex algodystrophy is very rare. I do not have seen a single case on that. We usually see in the foot or in the ankle area, bone marrow edema with soft tissue edema and on X-rays osteopenia. But in the shoulder, I have never seen such a case. Peripheral nerve injury may occur. Usually it is not permanent, it's transient. Here you see in the acute setting that there is um, edema in the teres minor and infraspinatus muscle, very nicely demonstrated on axial images. You see edema into uh, infraspinatus muscle. This was, not, um, uh, this was uh, due to a portal, posterior portal placement. And the more significant case, we see supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and um, uh, teres minor uh, edema on fat suppression images. You see that the metallic device has been displaced into the notch very close, abutting the suprascapular nerve. So overall, the post-op rotator cuff can be assessed by both ultrasound and magnetic reson resonance imaging in the post-operative setting. But regarding the major complications, uh, MRI is much better because it can also uh, uh, attract information, uh, extract information from the deep structures like the joint space. And of course, the appearance within the first six months may be difficult to interpret, but this normalizes over time more or less about one year. So the last question is, how I do it? The post-operative patient who has, who has pain, it is referred for investigation. The radiographs are the first step, and we have to have on the desk 
the immediate post-operative radiographs for comparison. After that, I'm doing dynamic ultrasound. Dynamic is the ultrasound which is performed uh, to assess if there is any entrapment of the, of the tendon just beneath uh, the acromion, uh, to assess any ongoing impingement, of course, to assess any return. If ultrasound is not conclusive, then we move on to magnetic resonance imaging, very rarely to magnetic resonance arthrography, and when we have contraindications, CT arthrography, particularly when we have many metallic, metallic components in the field of view. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. I would like to ask a question. How often uh, do you use ultrasound uh, in order to evaluate the rotator cuff repair after the operation? Operates? Always. Always, okay. Yes, I mean in symptomatic patients, yes, when yes. they are referred by the orthopedic surgeons. Okay. Always, you. it's easy, it's cheap, and um, it's also clinical. We can assess the, 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 the possible impingement. This is not possible with the MRI, which is a static method. Okay, thank you. Is there any more questions from the audience? Yes, thank you so much for your, uh, your, your very nice uh, lecture. I have a question because typically I am more comfortable with analyzing a subscapillary lesion with an ultra CT scanner. Uh, typically because in France we, are, we have more images with an ultra CT scan than with an MRI. And we also have the possibility to place the patient in external rotation and internal rotation. So do you think that this is a problem for you too? Or do you have enough images in an MRI to analyze the subscap from up to down? Uh, uh, I, I prefer ultrasound actually, because it's a superficial structure. And always with, um, with uh, the subscapularis, we are doing a dynamic examination. This is not possible with uh, magnetic resonance imaging. And uh, arthrography is used mainly in athletes. I don't think, don't think that it's a good idea to use arthrography in a lady 85 years old with an immune system which is suppressed. Um, the risk of um, infection is higher. Uh, I, I trust ultrasound. Okay, thank you very much. We can move on to thank the you. next session.